Welcome back to Exercise Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the length-tension relationship of muscle, which is a concept that you would see in an anatomy and physiology, regular physiology, and our exercise physiology courses. And before we begin, let's talk about some general things about muscles, skeletal muscles, that is. First of all, the functional unit of skeletal muscle that actually shortens is the sarcomere. And actually these five things right here represent different, uh, different states that the sarcomere can be in. Remember the sarcomere shortens, and if you look at all the sarcomere shortening at the same time, that's actually what you see as the shortening of the muscle fiber. Okay, And these red fibers right here, these red little lines, those are actually going to be representing actin, the thin filaments. Okay. The blue is going to be the myosin. Now notice, if you look really carefully on the myosin, like right over here, not towards the center, but just right over here on each edge, you see these little heads sticking up. Those are the myosin heads. And if you remember, in order to have shortening of the muscle fiber, you actually have to have overlap between the thin filament actin and the heads of myosin. Okay, now that's a very important. In general, it's actin to myosin have to overlap, but really it's the head of myosin, these little heads sticking out, that actually have to make contact with the actin, which is this red. Okay, so bear that in mind. And now let's talk about the uh, length tension relationship. And if we graph this, here's what we're looking at. On the x-axis, or horizontal axis, we're looking at the length of the sarcomere. Notice that the sarcomere contracts and it can expand. And so we can look at the length of that sarcomere. That's what's on the x-axis. On the vertical or y-axis, we have the tension generated by the muscle. This is the active force that is produced by the muscle fiber, okay? Accounting for all the sarcomeres at the same time. How much force as a percentage of its maximum? And we can graph this. And what ultimately happens is we get what's sort of what's called an inverted U because it sort of looks like a U, so to speak, upside down. Let's look in the center right here, number two. Let's just start there because that's where we have the maximum tension generated by the muscle. And just remember, we, in order to generate tension, we have to have overlap of actin and the myosin heads. And if you look at this, the red actin is overlapping optimally with the myosin heads. And if you don't understand why that's not optimally, you will in just a minute when we discuss these over here on the right and these on the left. But just take it, my word for now, up here at the top we have optimum overlap between actin and myosin heads, and that's going to produce the maximum tension. And this graph is going to say it's between about 2.1 and 2.2 micrometers. That's the length of the sarcomere that produces this optimum overlap. Um, some texts will say 2 to 2.2 micrometers. Um, it's whatever. It's just around this range produces the optimum overlap. Now, on the right side, we see that the tension developed actually starts to fall. Why is that? Well, in, over here on the right, the sarcomere is actually extending. It's lengthening. Okay, we see the increased length over here. In this state number three, what's happening? Well, if we look at it, it's lengthening. Notice that we only now have a certain percentage of the actin that's overlapping with the myosin. Whereas where it was optimum, we had all the myosin heads were bound to actin. Right? All the possible myosin heads are bound to actin. Here, not all of them are bound to actin. Some of them overlap, but some of them don't. And so because we have a, a smaller percentage of myosin heads that are overlapping with the actin, the tension developed is going to drop. I think that makes some sense. Now if we go to number four here, notice now it's lengthened to the point where none of the actin is actually overlapping with the myosin. Or we could say none of the myosin heads are overlapping with the actin. That's going to give us either very, very, very low tension or none at all. Okay, so notice no myosin heads are overlapping with actin. So this side of the graph really just tells us that in order to get maximum tension developing in the muscle fiber, you have to have as many myosin heads bound to actin as possible. As you start to decrease that percentage of myosin heads that are bound to actin, from here maybe about 40% of them to zero, the tension is going to drop that's developed by the muscle fiber. Okay, That's what happens when you lengthen the sarcomeres. Over on the left side, we have two different things that are happening. Notice we have 
a kind of a shallow drop off of force developed or tension developed. And then at this point, it really drops off a lot faster as designated by the much uh, steeper slope. And those are for two different reasons. But in any case, on the left side of this graph, we're actually shortening the sarcomere. So what's happening over on this side right here? Well, remember, the thick filament in blue right here, remember, the center part of it has no myosin heads. So if we shorten the sarcomere more than this at its optimum, notice that part of the actin is not actually bound to myosin because the center region of the thick filament has no myosin heads. So if we shorten the sarcomere a little bit uh, shorter than its resting length, which is its optimal resting length right here, then there's portions of the actin that don't have a myosin partner, and so no cross bridges are forming there. So just like over here on the right side, we're having lo a lower number of cross bridges, a lower percentage of myosin bound to actin. The same thing is true over here, except over here it's on the shortening side. We have regions of actin that are not bound to myosin because there's no myosin in the center of the sarcomere. Okay? And that obviously causes the force developed or tension developed to drop off. But it's not a very steep drop off. Once you get to this point, it's very steep. And let's talk about why that is. This is when you shorten the sarcomere even more than it was right here. So now over here, in addition to the fact that you have actin overlapping with an area of the thick filament where there's no myosin heads, now you have the actin that's overlapping with actin. And the actin on the right side is effectively blocking the actin on the left side from binding to myosin, and vice versa. It works both ways. So again, you have regions of actin that are not bound to myosin, but it's also augmented by the fact that the actin is blocking other regions of actin. Okay, And so that's why the slope here drops off even more or quicker than it does up here uh, near the optimum resting length. Okay. So, again, the tension developed is going to drop off very quickly. And if you actually graph this, like we said, if you look at the length of the sarcomere and graph it uh, versus the tension that's developed in the muscle as a percentage of the maximum, we get this sort of inverted U-shape. Now, in real life, if you were actually to do an experiment like this, it's not perfectly straight lines like this. This is really just... Um, an artist rendition so that conceptually students can understand it. It really looks, it's more of a, an actual curved U, more or less. Uh, but this is just conceptually what's going on. And the rationalization as to why each uh, thing is happening in uh, the graph. Okay, so hopefully this made a little bit of sense. Hopefully you now understand the length tension relationship of muscle. All right, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.